church who say they want their unsaved loved ones saved. I'm tired of hearing people say I'm concerned about my troubled marriage when it's just talk, rhetoric. I don't want to hear any more talk about how immoral America has become, how godless our society, how corrupt our business. I'm tired of hearing about Islam taking control and Christians losing power. And how dead the church has become because of that too is rhetoric, meaningless. Away with all of our how-to conferences because they accomplish nothing. It's how to cope, how to build a bigger church, how to reach the lost, how to improve your people's skills, and how to impact the world in this computer time. And I look at the whole religious scene today, and all I see are the inventions and ministries of man and flesh. It's mostly powerless. It has no impact on the world. And I see more of the world coming into the church and impacting the church rather than the church impacting the world. I see the music taking over the house of God. I see entertainment taking over the house of God. An obsession with entertainment in God's house, a hatred of correction and a hatred of reproof. Nobody wants to hear it anymore. Church. Tell me but I also believe that many Christians are misinformed about the meaning of the church. They really don't understand what the church of Jesus Christ is. And I say that because of the way we measure the success of the church today. We have mega churches. We've got super churches, we've got fastest growing churches, and we look at these beautiful multi-million dollar buildings, we look at the wonderful 30, 40, 50 acre campuses, and we see churches packed with thousands, and we say, God must be there, that must be God's church. Look, their finances, they have money in the bank, they have multitudes coming, that must be a very successful church. Jesus must be at work in that church. But folks, I'm so glad to inform you that that is not God's measure of success. You can have multiplied thousands in church. You can have a burgeoning budget. You can have all of these things and Jesus not be in the building. Jesus not even acknowledge it that it's his. Highly esteemed among men, very successful, popular, accepted, but abomination in the eyes of God. I just described a great majority of North American Christianity. If anyone starts talking about law, if anyone starts talking about biblical principles on what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do, how we're to live and not supposed to live, everyone starts screaming legalists. Legalists. But Jesus said, depart from me, those of you who lived you called me Lord, but you lived as though I had never given a law. In American Christianity today, pass through the gate, praise God. Live like the rest of the world and it's okay, you're just carnal, maybe one day you'll come back. Do you know what happens because of our bad evangelism? We have gazillions of children saved in vacation Bible school. When they hit 15 years old, they enter into the world and live like demons, a great majority of them. And then when they're around 30, they come back and rededicate their life. Maybe they just got saved. Because, folks, it's more than just telling someone you're saved because you acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Satan acknowledges that Jesus is Lord. Is your life in a process of change? We've held on to our religious rhetoric and our revival talk, but we've become so passive. Our so-called awakenings, our stirrings, last but a short time and when the last when the re short-lived revivings and awakenings come from the hand of God they are so short-lived and in those times we promise God we'll never return to our passivity but it's not long it's just weeks or months and we're back and this time we slip further back into passivity than when we started I speak from experience if you're a Christian, you need to build your life upon the rock.
Because if you build your life upon the sand, you'll be an unhappy Christian and your life won't go right. That is not what Jesus is teaching and history backs me up on it. It was hardly ever interpreted that way. Do you know what the interpretation is? It goes like this. There are two ways. There's a narrow way and a broad way. Which one are you on? There are two types of trees. There is a good tree that bears good fruit and is going to heaven. There's a bad tree and you know it's bad because it bears bad fruit and it's going to hell. It's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. There are those who profess Jesus as Lord and they do the will of the Father who is in heaven. And there are those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and they do not do the will of the Father who is in heaven and they go to hell. Not because of a lack of works but because of a lack of faith demonstrated by the fact that they had no works. And then he goes on. This is not two Christians building their house on two different foundations. No. This again is a saved man and a lost man. The lost man hears the word of God preached, but he lays no foundation. You cannot see in any way in his life how the word of God is forming and building and sustaining his life. His life. The time when men, according to the prophecy of Jesus, wax worse and worse and that is happening. A church that's defiled with pedophilia, child molestation, incest, adultery. A nation in a moral landslide that's inundated with pornographic filth that the whole world blushes at. And now out of Cannes Film Festival, according to the New York Times, there's a new movie about to hit the shores of the United States with 13, 14 year old kids having unspeakable kinds of sex with adults. And they said at the Cannes Film Festival, and it's the boast of Cannes Festival, that we have not only pushed the envelope, we've gone over the edge. And America's now ripe for it. Are you building your marriage on the Word of God? Are you raising your children on the Word of God? Are you doing your finances on the Word of God? Are you living, separating yourself from the things of this world based upon the Word of God? How many would be able to answer positively? No. None of that. I profess Jesus. He's my Savior. And my Sunday school teacher told me... How else do you explain that multiplied numbers of Christians go home and watch HBO a program I've never seen I don't have television but I read about it in the newspaper today in the New York Times called the Sopranos this is a mafia bunch that kill and murder and maim gratuitous sex cheating lying mafia and we have Millions of Christians now in the United States getting together and talking about the next show and they're addicted to it. Addicted. Some of you hearing me now, that's your favorite show. No laughing. This is life and death. Did you come here tonight and did you raise your hands and sing and shout and have a good time? And you know you've been watching this filth? I preach in a lot of places like this once. I could have got up here today with a vocabulary that would have astounded you and preached you things that would have lifted you up and floated you around this room. I could have told you stories that would have made you laugh and stories about dogs and grandmas that would have made you cry. But I love you too much for that. I know, I know because the Word of God is true that there are people who believe themselves to be saved and they're no more saved. They're not. I know that there are some of you who look around and you think, well, I'm saved. I mean, look, I look like everybody else in my youth group. What makes you think your youth group is saved? Well, I'm like my parents, or I'm like the adults in my church, or the deacon, or the pastor. What does that matter? You won't be judged by them on the day of His coming. My question for you, beloved, my question for you, little child, I mean, you could be my children. 
And I pray someday when my little boy grows that there will be a preacher who will stand before him and say, Enough of this! Let's get down. What does the Word of God say? How does your life stand in front of that blazing fire which is the holiness of God on that final day? We've got people now that are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. We become like the children of Israel who said the right words. But here's what God said. I've heard the words of this people. They have well said all that they've spoken. All that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. He said, oh, you have the right words. You sing the right songs, but your heart is not right. Does it matter to you today? Does it matter to you at all that God's spiritual Jerusalem, the church, is now married to the world? That there's such a coldness sweeping the land. So many people I know that were my friends and I see them go one by one, husbands and wives into such passivity. Going to churches where they can find smooth messages, no longer wanting to hear anything of wrath or of correction. Some of my closest friends, I see them falling by the wayside. And, he's, and his, the cry is, is it nothing to you? You see, when spiritual blindness comes, very few recognize it. It's the last recognized thing that happens to a child of God. If I, as a pastor, knew you personally, and I was watching your life, and as one of the pastors of this church, I come to you and say, I... I I love you, but I have to tell you the truth. You're changing. You know what you were. Something of the world has got in your heart. I don't know if it's television. I don't know what it is that has your heart, but I see changes in you. I, I don't see the brokenness. I don't see the compassion you had once for your family. I don't see concern for your unsaved loved ones. You're changing. Little by little, something's happening to you. Would it bring you to your knees when the ruin that you are not even aware of is suddenly brought before your eyes? And to tell you the truth, I thank God for the anointing and the singing tonight. I thank God for the praises that came from so many sanctified hearts living in covenant with the Lord. But the truth of the matter is, in all honesty, there are numbers among us that are changing, and they don't know it. You've lost your fight. You see, when you, when you read the book of Joshua, it's almost a book of failure, because they lost their heart. They lost the fight. That's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill it. So you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't weep before God anymore. You can sit and watch television and your family go to hell. Hmm. So you're losing the love of God, the love of Christ. Little by little, these things are making inroads. Folks, why do you think your pastors cry out against television? Do you think we get any pleasure out of the flesh? This is no pleasure in somebody coming and saying, I heard your message and I threw away my television. That doesn't give me any pleasure. It doesn't give any pastor pleasure. We have given account because we watch for your soul. These things, I don't know where it is on the job, things we listen to, these things that creep in and suddenly this Jerusalem, the walls go down. And ruin sets in. Oh, my God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, God. I don't care about reputation. I don't care what men think. I want you to be honored. I want, I want these young people to be saved. I want those that are saved 
to stop looking around them at a cultural Christianity that you hate and will spew out of your mouth and that they will look at the Word of God and say, I will follow Jesus. Oh God, I pray for youth ministers and pastors and I pray that you'd fill them with a spirit of wisdom and love and boldness and discernment. And dear God, whatever the cost, I pray that you would raise up missionaries. I can't help but look at these kids and think of my own little boy. Oh God, that you would save Ian and that you would raise him up and send him into the worst part of the battle. Oh dear God, raise up missionaries here. Raise up missionaries. Raise up preachers and pastors and reachers and evangelists. That know the word of God. Oh God, work in this place. Please work in this place, dear God. No, the sermons won't do it. I know that a new revelation won't do it. Covenant won't do it. I know now. Oh my God, do I know it. Until I'm in agony. Until I have been anguished over it. I'm preaching sermons. Oh God, I'm preaching sermons. Then I said, no, it's too late. I don't have that much time. And all our projects... All our ministries, everything we do, where are the Sunday school teachers that weep over kids they know are not hearing and they're going to hell? Oh, everywhere I go, somebody's got a project, somebody's got a plan or a dream. That's all it is, it's an idea. They didn't come to me. From a broken heart, they didn't come to me after hours of fasting and praying and mourning. Not a broken heart. It's an idea. I'm sick of it. Here's what a sister wrote to me this past week. She said, Brother Dave, I'm so hungry for the Lord. I'm so tired of how-to meetings. It's all spiritual fluff. I was told of a woman's conference that was going to be a great spiritual experience, so I went with a group of sisters. There were 15,000 women. I was horrified the first night when they opened the conference with a comedy sketch. It went from bad to worse. These, we were hoodwinked by the leaders. There was not a single prayer not one mention of prayer. It was a farce. And I'm as empty as I've ever been. The church of Jesus Christ is comprised of individuals who are wholly given to Christ. He has become their life. He's not a part of life. He is their life. He's the focus. He's the center. Now, that's where the church begins. It's comprised of individuals wholly given to him with their own revelation of who he is. With their own hearts burning for the word of God. They spend no time with him. They're not seekers after him. But the Bible said they're foolish. And they're in real danger if they don't soon recognize how vulnerable they are because they're totally unprepared to meet Jesus when he comes. There's no talk about total commitment to Jesus Christ. There's no talk here at all about love, devotion, commitment. We'll do our own thing. Just let us be called by your name. And say, I am married to Christ. Ask them the last time they spent 15 minutes in his presence loving him. Ask them the last time they picked up this Bible just to find out who Jesus is and even read one chapter. Here are people that God has blessed. Here are the people that God has touched. He's kept them. He's given them health and strength. He's given them children that love them. Young people even that God has blessed and, and kept and protected. And they can't even lay down at night and say, Thank See, if you, you don't have a history of prayer, if you don't have this willingness to share God's heart, you get it by asking Him for it. He said, I'll, I'll give. I'm more willing to give you are to receive. This is something you ask. Oh, God, I... 
I, I want to step out now and I want to know your heart. And when you begin to seek his face, you allow him to melt and break you. You come into this communion with the Lord. Out of that experience, you see, God has called us to live in anguish. This is the birth, this is the womb of something God is stirring, God wanting to accomplish and, and bringing out of ruin, restoration in your family, whatever it may be. he bring you down into this baptism. Now, just like the baptism waters, you come up, you come out. But you'll come out with this instant knowing of God's voice. The servant who willingly takes on the mantle of God's pain is the only servant who has the authority and the right to hold God to his covenant promises. We've preached covenant here. But only those who've known his heart and in those times have allowed God to bring healing and has allowed God to go down deep in the soul and say, oh God, I can't do this on my own, but I'm not going to let my kids go to hell. I'm not going to let my husband, my wife. Oh God, I'm not going to live in this death. I'm not going to live in this lukewarmness and this coldness anymore. God, change me. And when you get desperate before God, you set your heart to seek him. Then you can hold God to his covenant promises. Look, look at you meet the church anywhere on earth where you find an individual that is totally voted to Jesus Christ. And if they are, you'll know it very quickly and shortly and the bond will be there. We here talk about the church being united. Let, 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 let's unite the church. Let's everybody get together. Folks, you don't have to. It's already together. It's all in Christ. He's the head, we're the body. It has always been together. It's never been divided. Never. If, you, if, if Jesus could come and, and take you on a flying carpet trip over the, the America, around the world, and you say, Jesus, show me the church. And he would take you into the atmosphere, so to speak, and, and, and you'd look at the, he takes you to hover over a great church of 5,000 people and say, Lord, show me your church. And he said, all right, you see the woman over here, and see this one over here, and he'll pick up maybe 10 or 12, and it, it said, that's my church. These are my devoted ones. But Lord, what about those thousands there that are singing love songs to you? He said, my heart, they don't have a heart for me. They, I, I, am, I am just a word to them. It's just deed. It's just word and it's not in deed. They don't love the truth. They don't spend any time with me. That is not my church. They don't have the devoted Christian heart. cries out, my beloved is mine and I am his. And the Bible says when the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. This tells me we're living in the fulfillment of that prophecy right now. They all slumbered. Even the wise were sleeping. I said, Lord, how can wise people who, who've been preparing have extra oil, how can they go to sleep? The truth is, Jesus prophesied in the last days there's going to be a great falling away. Now, th this is very important. I want you to hear it. This suggests to me that just before Christ comes, there's going to be a great sleep and slothfulness and slumber come upon many Christians. Many, many believers are going to be tested by this, I believe, with everything in my heart. When you, when I... Folks, it's getting late and it's getting serious. Please don't tell me. Don't tell me you're concerned. Don't tell me that you want your unsaved loved ones saved when you're spending hours in front of internet or television. Come on. You have to have an experience. But this is this has really been burning in my heart when there's a sluggishness. But I would say, you become sluggish about my ways and you begin to drift. That will cast you into a deep sleep. It'll drive you into a sleep. A little here and a little there. Something has to happen. This can't go on. And when we are getting so close that day, you see, there will be this cry, our lamps are gone out. They don't have the resources to face what is coming. Their hearts, Jesus.
disciples failed them for fear. And they're going to run to Christians, they're going to run to pastors and say, what do I do, what do I do? It says, go buy oil from those who sell it. I, I think the whole thing is the Lord saying, there's not going to be time. It just, it simply is that. There's not going to be time to build your Christian character. There's not going to be time to build up spiritual resources. You're not going to have the time. Our lamps have gone out. We're empty. We're dry. We've wasted our life. We've wasted our time. And now the coming of the Lord draws nigh. And I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. And you say, if you have it in your mind today, that when Jesus comes or you die, suddenly you say, at that moment I'll change. Death is going to change me. Suddenly I'll have a heart for Jesus. Suddenly I'll be talking about Him. Suddenly I'll be praising Him. No, no, no. Death doesn't change anything. You're going to be known as you are known now. Same character you have now, you'll have when you stand before Jesus. Nothing's going to change. You're going to stand before Him just as you are in your sins and wickedness. Nothing's going to change. I said with tears and brokenness because I have to stand before God. The Bible says, while they were gone, the bridegroom came and the door was shut. Then they came knocking and said, Lord, Lord, let us in. And Jesus opens the door and says, I don't even know you. I didn't know you. You never even tried to know me. We're strangers. The door is shut. Now take that for what you mean. I know there are many people who say, well, that doesn't say they're going to hell. But... Folks, the Bible said the door is shut. To me, that, that's frightening. To me, what else can you say? The door is shut. Jesus shut the door in your face. And how hard that must be for the Savior. Because he's just and holy God. You were warned time and time and time again. I accept the word of the living God. I'm convicted. And I want to go further than I've ever been. I want to know Jesus like I've never known him. I don't want to give my time to him. Now, Father, I thank you. You're faithful to your word. What great love you have for us. Lord, you love the wise and you love the foolish. But you made a promise. The day you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me.